Right. Good afternoon. Um, this is a little talk on drone control and specifically how we could use the angle and magnitude criteria to design a PD controller. So that's what we're going to try and get to. Um, here's the little drone that I'm going to control and fly using the PD controller. Um, it's a Parrot mini drone. And you can tell it's working because the, uh, the little lights are flashing there. And it's a quadcopter um, with four propellers on, some guards on. These fall off when it crashes, which is quite good because it crashes quite often. Um, and I just want to go through some of the elementary dynamic modelling and transfer functions so that we can understand where the transfer functions have come from when we do our PD design. So, if we think of our little quad here, um, it can do various manoeuvres, but the main manoeuvre we're looking at today is that a vertical translation. So all four rotors now will provide upward thrust when you switch them on. So we could think of the quad here as having four rotors, some mass, it's not, it doesn't weigh much, it weighs about about one newton, I reckon, slightly under a newton. Um, so I've reduced about the newton. Um, got four, so a quarter each, so they provide some sort of thrust. It's got a mass and it can move up and down in this plane. So we can apply now Newton's laws of motion, F equals ma, but the thrust, rather than force, call it thrust, is m, and then we tend to call z. Now z uh, is like the motion up and down, and we tend to have z as positive going down because that, that's the natural tendency but to fall down when you let it go so Z will be in that direction and so we can say that thrust is called MZ double dot and we know that Z double dot can be represented by uh, 1 over S squared or S, S squared Z not that 1 over S squared S squared Z so if, we go, so if you like just get rid of this and then we can say that Z double dot is equal to d2 by dt squared times z, which would be s squared z. So we can replace z double dot by s squared z, move the s into there, and that gives a transfer function now that the z is equal to 1 over ms squared times t, where t is the thrust. So there's a sort of starting off position for our model. We've also got a motor though, there's some little motors on these, they're only quite small motors, you can probably see them there. There's the motor there but they're quite powerful little things if you put your finger in there what's going it, it does hurt um, so the, the thrust can be modeled by a first order lag k over 1 plus st times some voltage that you apply to the motor so we could add that in as a little front end to our transfer function and this gives us then the overall transfer function that we will play with and we've got to choose k and t now t is quite quick. Those motors go around very quickly. If you increase the voltage, it does increase quickly. And I found T for these motors, T to be 0.05 of a second. So they're quite quick little motors. They can increase their speed in about 50 milliseconds. So 50 milliseconds, quite quick. Now, there's one extra little trick though we need to bear in mind here for the real application, which is that obviously when we're applying this equation here, this drone, it's like in a gravity field. So if I, I drop it, I drop it, it does fall. And so we've got mg now pulling it down. So we've actually got f minus mg equals m double dot. Uh, so t minus mg is mz double dot, where this is said here. So what we do in, a, in the drone control, we apply some pre-force, pre-voltage if you like, to the motors, which compensate for the weight of the helicopter or the, or the drone. This is like a feed-forward term. So it's an extra term there that we apply to the, to, the, to the voltage here. And that voltage, if you apply that, it'll just make it so neutrally buoyant. Now the trouble with this feed-forward term is that you can't get it exact because the how quickly it comes up will depend on how well the battery is charged. But it'll not be far off running at full power speeds, but they might not run at full power, they might run at say 
95% of full power. In which case, this term will exactly cancel the weight of the thing. So, um, so in our overall flight control system, then we have this type of arrangement. Um, we've got the this is the bit that, that feed forwards. It, there's our transfer function. This is the bit of feed forward signal that like neutralizes the weight, so as it, it hasn't got any weight, it hasn't got gravity to contend with. We normally have a PD controller in here, but we just put a little bit of I in. And the I gets rid of steady state error. And so because you can't exactly balance this signal here against the true weight of the helicopter or the, the drone, then we'll need to try a very small amount of I just to make sure that the error in the steady state goes to zero. So what can happen is, because I've done this quite a few times, I can just do a little sketch for you, have two sketches. So let's say the battery's in really good condition, then this signal will be spot on, and it'll just come up and do that. But say your battery's not as good, it'll come up, go down, and it'll just dawdle down there somewhere. Not much, only about two or three percent, but it will dawdle below the steady state, and then the eye will just slowly pull it up like that. So you can, if your battery's not quite right, you can get a transient of that. If your battery's in good condition, it'll, this signal will cancel out perfectly. So that's why we're having to have a little bit of eye in, but really the eye is so small that we don't need to consider it for design purposes, it's just a touch of eye. Um, so it's not a very big value by. So therefore the main design thinking now is we can do away on the model, that's a real drone, in the model for the simulation, we can do away with that term there, drop the eye, and look at a PD design for this now. And in order to do the PD design, we're going to use the angle and magnitude criteria, and then we can design into this then some different transient responses, some different damping ratios, some different overshoots, and try a whole range of designs, and then see which one we like best. So what I'm going to do next is, I'm going to use the angle and magnitude criteria to design the PD controller in four different cases. One is like lightly damped, two lightly damped, reasonably well lightly damped, critically damped, and heavily damped. There's four cases to look at, we'll do those designs, and then what we'll do is we'll put the controller games onto the quad and we'll fly it. So I've got the little video of each one flying, um, and what also can happen is, which you also see in the video, is sometimes the control system goes wrong for some reason, and then it just sort of zooms off, and then you hear a crash, and it comes back broken. Fortunately, you can buy new props, I've broken about 10 props on this, but these bits seem quite robust. They fall off these bits when, they, when it hits something. Quite handy, really. So one good thing about a drone is make sure that the, the crash barriers like give rather than break. They just break off and go back on. But your props do go. You can buy new props. You get them from Amazon, and then they just pull off and put on. So it's quite easy. So, um, so this is our drone, and we're going to look at the drone control. And in particular, we're going to be looking at PD design for the model using the angle and magnitude criteria. And we'll do, as I say, four different designs and then you can watch it fly and see how you think it performs. So this is the first part. So thanks. We'll continue in a second. Okay, so now looking at PD controller design. And well, let's have quite a simple little slide this is fundamental to quite a few of our calculations. A lot of the controllers are implemented as KP plus KDS. So this is like U, that button, this is E. So we've got like U is KP plus KDS times E, or U is KP plus KD, then S times E is E dot. That's why it's the P P, P plus D controller. So that's how those control systems are implemented. The design technique that we're going to do though for the designs is a root loci design. Now root loci likes poles. Root loci likes poles. It's all done in poles. 
rather than the time constants or anything else. It's all been imposed. So we have to rewrite this as in some pole form. So I've rewritten it as K1 S plus K2. So this is rewritten in that format there. So this is a pole now, or a zero if you like, poles and zeros. We should call it zeros, I suppose. Poles and zeros, should be back to front. Um, so this is a zero, and it's in a, in a format for a zero, S plus something. So we got, know that K1 S plus K2 is the same as this. So therefore we can, we can do a sort of compare coefficients. We've got K1S is the same as KDS. So therefore K1 is KD. And we know that K1 times K2 is the term without the S in. So KP is K1 times K2. So what we'll do is when we're doing our designs, we have that in this format. And then we'll work out K1 and K2. And once we've got K1 and K2, we go back to this equation then to get the KD and the KP to go in here. And this will be the case now for all our designs that we do. So it's certainly well worth remembering this little video showing you how to go from there to there and there to there backwards and forwards. But this is like vital now because we have to do all our designs using the angle and magnitude criteria. In order to do that to root row site, and they design, they, they demand that the transfer functions are in pole zero format. Remember, pole zero format is where we have one s say plus two, and we'll say s plus six. That would be in pole zero format. If we had something like say four s plus nine, we'll get three s plus two. This now is not in pole zero format because you've got numbers in front of you. So you have to take those numbers out and have one S there and one S. It's got to be just one S in every single term to be in pole zero format for, for root row site. Okay, so next thing, we're just gonna have a quick reminder within PT controller design, um, what the angle and magnitude criteria were or are in terms of some sort of equations and how you can manipulate them. So imagine now we've got, this is a, an S-plane uh, diagram. This is real look this way, imaginary this way. And we plotted out on here now our poles. Here's our poles. And a little dot with a circle around as our zeros. And then, um, this point now we know, we have to know this point is on the root row side. So this point is definitely on the root row side. So we, we know that before we start. If we then draw straight lines from the point to all the poles and zeros, we can then measure some angles. And we're going to call the pole angles beta i and the zero angles alpha i. And the angle criteria is relatively simple. It says the sum of the zero angles minus some of the pole angles will come exactly to minus 180. And so if we do that for this particular example, I've got two zeros, alpha one and alpha two, so it'll be alpha one and alpha two. I've got four poles, so it'll be beta one plus beta two plus beta three, so minus those is equal to minus 180. And this now would be my angle criteria. And I'll say, if we didn't know this point was on the root row side, we could add these numbers up. If they came to 180, we would know they were there, that'd be one way you could use it. But what we're going to do is, we're going to do a slightly different trick. What we're going to do is, we're going to design, we're going to be designing a PD controller of the form of K1 S plus K2. So what we're going to be doing is add, designing a zero really, because the first thing we need to know is what that number is, K2. And K2 now will be a zero. So if we imagine now that this one here, this zero is at minus K2, but we don't know necessarily what K2 is. So if we took this equation now, so we know this point on the root row side, we would know what alpha one was. We wouldn't know what alpha two was, so alpha two would be unknown. That'd be unknown, but we'd know 
what theta 1 and theta 2 b3 and b4 were, and we know that's minus 180. So this equation now you could solve for alpha 2. So our process is going to be, we're going to use the angle, angle criteria to work out where to put the zero in our PD controller by again, put, choosing some design points here for where we want the root loci to be, and then going into this equation, solving it for alpha 2, then if we draw a line here, so that one's parallel to this one, if we then measure, we solve for alpha 2, if we measure this angle here as alpha 2, so we draw the line in down alpha 2, and then measure from there to there, that will give us K2. So that's going to be our thinking behind this PD design in this um, root loci where the PD control is written as a gain and a zero. So that's going to be our thinking for the design now. We can choose this point here to be anywhere we like. So we can set, typically what we can do is we can set a second order system equation. S squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared equals naught. We can choose then an omega n and a zeta, stick them into this, and that will solve that equation, and we get some root minus a plus or minus bj. So this point then becomes the point minus a plus bj. So what we do is in our design. We choose what damping ratio and natural frequency we want for the system to behave, stick them into this equation, solve them to, using that equation minus b plus or minus the square of b squared minus 4 co 2 a Gives us the root then, which appears here. Once we know where the root is, we can then draw these lines in to the poles and zeros, but we can't draw in to the zero added in by the PD controller because we don't know where it is. So, but when we get down to this equation now, we'll know all the variables in here except for alpha 2. So we can solve this for alpha 2, then go to the point, measure down alpha 2, and then this distance then is k2, and we've got part of our PD controller designed. Once we've done that then, we need to get k1. So we then fix this point at this point here, minus k2, we could then apply the magnitude criteria to this diagram now, and bingo, we would get K1 from it. So that be so that's our basic design PD design philosophy, if you like. We're going to design a K1 plus S plus K2. We're going to choose our second order system response, if you like, with terms of damping ratio and natural frequency. Get that point plotted in the argon diagram, then drew our poles and zeros, applied the angle criteria and solved it for alpha 2. Then we get K2, this, this angle, alpha 2 gives us the angle, that distance gives us the K2, and then we've got the number that goes in from there. Once you've got that number fixed, we can then apply the um, magnitude criteria, and the magnitude criteria involves measuring so you have to measure that one as m1, that one is m1 hat, that one is m2, that one as m2 hat, that one there, I'll say m3, and this one here is m4. So you could measure those. So you can measure those. You could use your ruler to do this. This is my specially designed ruler. It's not got any scales, that's got scales on it, like one, two, three, and it's Got a reasonable scale to it. Um, you can measure those distances, stick them in then to this formula here, and you get K1. And then you'd have your K1 and your K2 in your overall design, which would then guarantee that your complex roots, dominant complex roots, had these natural frequency dumping measures, which will again give you the sort of type of transient response you're expecting to get from the overall control system. So that's the basic thinking now behind using the angle and magnitude criteria to actually do the design for us. All right, so here's our MATLAB analysis now. And I've inserted this transfer function here. Um, 
and I'm looking at this to, to come up with this control again at the end. So I've chosen it's a different, slightly different way of doing it, this bit, so it's getting the same answer. My zero was at 1.66, so I put that in, and I'm making sure I get my gain at 0 0.9 to give me my design points. If like I'm using MATLAB to check what I did was correct. So I put in this, these two, this one, and I put this in, but without the 0.9 in, which is going to be S plus 1.66 of it. There it is there. So I'm plotting the root loci of this function here now, and this is the root loci plot. Then dragging my mouse along here, and when I get to a certain point here, I can see natural frequency is 12, which is what we're after. Damper ratio 0.75, and here's the root at minus 9 plus or minus 8j or 8i, and the gain is 0.9. So that 0.9 now is going in there, so it sort of confirms now that the design I did was correct. It's, maybe, it's a way of checking, really, if you like, what I've done. I can then put these gains now of 1.5 and 0.9 into here and simulate this. So if I simulate response, this is this, the simulation now. So it's hardly got any overshoot at all in. And this is the sort of time response I've got with this particular controller. I then put this controller then onto the drone and flew the drone. We can see the drone fly in a moment when we've done this particular little video, but I then stored the data and replayed it and then compared it now. So this is the actual drone flying with those gains and this is the simulated value. So you can see the shape we've got here, quite similar shape and quite similar transient. So next thing to do is actually watch the drone now as it does this transient response. And then we can then, it, this is where it lands. So it, if it comes up to the height of 1.1 meters. So it's 1.1 meters set point on this. And at a certain point here, it decides to land. When it gets down to here, this last part, you can't measure very accurately. So it just sort of stops measuring. So this is uh, the transient response we got from the real drone. And um, we'll compare that now with the flight, which we're gonna see next.